Hello everyone and welcome to the Unanswered Questions True Crime Podcast. I have spent hours and hours investigating this. He basically told her that people have been killed. Journalists, independent investigators, people like that disappeared. It frightened her to the bone. There's more to the story than meets the eye. There were rumors of torture and homicide and sexual abuse, all sorts of egregious, horrendous crimes. He was polygraphed three times. Each of those three showed evasions. His resumes were a skeleton of truth. He was mad at the world, and particularly mad at the government. The study that he commissioned that described a fictional terrorist attack. If people have died over this, it means you're getting close to the truth. You don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to say, what the fuck? Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of my new podcast, Unanswered Questions, where every week we will endeavour to discuss a mysterious unsolved case that has many lingering unanswered questions. So I hope you enjoy and as always leave me some feedback on what you think about the show and rate it as well. Now on to the show. This week we'll be talking about the Federated Ship Painters and Dockers Union. Now, the Federated Ship Painters and Dockers Union, FSPDU, was an Australian trade union which existed between 1900 and 1993. It represented labourers in the shipbuilding industry, covering mostly work associated with chipping, painting, scrubbing and cleaning ships, working in every size of tanks, cleaning boilers, docking and undocking vessels, and rigging work. Now we come to the history and establishment of this union. The Painters and Dockers Union had its origins in the New South Wales Associated Labourers Union, also known as the Balmain Labourers Union, which was established in Balmain in May of 1883. The new union was formed to represent all unskilled workers or labourers in that area, but was focused mainly on shipbuilding and ship repair, the main industry in Balmain at the time. The union gradually grew in stature over the next decade, affiliating with the Trades and Labour Council of Sydney in 1889 and establishing the Balmain Trades and Labour Hall in 1890. The union was involved in the unsuccessful 1890 maritime strike. The union was also heavily involved in the formation of the first branch of the Labour Electoral League of New South Wales, the forerunner to the Australian Labour Party in Balmain in April of 1891. The union's finances suffered during the depression of the 1890s, and in January of 1898, the union's members unanimously voted for its dissolution. Following the dissolution of the Balmain Labourers' Union, its members were reorganised along industrial lines, with the broad coverage of unskilled and semi-skilled workers in the shipbuilding industry split mainly between the Federated Iron Workers Association and the Federated Ship Painters and Dockers Union of Port Jackson, the latter being formally established in 1900. The union conducted two successful strikes in the same year, establishing closed shop arrangements in the industry. The union soon expanded out of Balmain to represent painters and dockers working throughout Sydney Harbour, growing rapidly from 449 members in 1902 to 1,954 in 1907. The union achieved its first industrial award in 1903, a collective agreement with employers registered by consent before amalgamating with similar unions in other states to form the Federated Ship Painters and Dockers Union of Australia in 1909. The union achieved federal registration in 1916, giving it access to the federal system of arbitration and conciliation courts. Now we come to the 1890 Australian Maritime Dispute. The 1890 Australian Maritime Dispute was an industrial dispute that began on the 15th of August 1890 when the Mercantile Marine Officers Association directed its members to give 24 hours notice to their employers after negotiations broke down with the Steamship Owners Association of Victoria over long-standing pay and condition claims. Industrial action quickly spread to seamen, wharf labourers and gas stokers. Coal miners from Newcastle, broke Hill and even New Zealand were locked out after refusing to dig coal for non-union operated vessels. By September 1890, 28,500 workers were on strike. The Melbourne branch of the Marine Officers Association had joined the Melbourne Trades Hall Council and the New Zealand branch was affiliated with the Maritime Labour Council. In July of 1890, the Union Steamship Company of New Zealand had conceded a pay rise of one pound following arbitration. Many of the owners had privately conceded that an increase in pay was justified and overdue. The Sydney branch of the union, not affiliated with the Sydney Maritime Council, negotiated with the owners and were told their case was reasonable but could not be considered while the Melbourne branch was affiliated with Melbourne Trades Hall. In a last minute mediation, officials of the union agreed to withdraw from the Melbourne Trades Hall if employers agreed to compromise in a last minute meeting with a union delegation. The ship owners refused to meet the delegation which thus precipitated the strike. 
ostensibly overpaying conditions, the cause of the dispute were considered more complex and point to an employer conspiracy to render trade union activity ineffective and employer activity to counter union solidarity and secondary boycott of non-union Sean Wall in the pastoral industry. While some historians argue that the strike was caused by a downturn in economic conditions, others argue the depression of the 1890s did not start until 1892. In early July 1890, the Amalgamated Sharers Union of Australasia issued a manifesto calling for a boycott on non-union Woolshorn in the coming shearing season. This emulated a successful boycott of non-union wool called by the Queensland Shearers Union in 1889 and instituted by the Wharf Labourers Union and Brisbane Trades Hall. The campaign to break union solidarity was engineered by Steve Adore Alfred Lamb, a member of the New South Wales Legislative Assembly, owner of one of the four main wool exporting firms and vice president of the New South Wales Employers Union. He attended meetings of the Pastoralist Union of New South Wales and Pastoralist Union of Victoria and organised a memorandum of understanding and agreements among wool shippers, shipping agents and ship owners. Now we get into the social turmoil. During the strike, military units were extensively used in New South Wales and Victoria. Armed troops were deployed to support the police in Sydney, Melbourne, Newcastle and a number of other ports around Australia as violence escalated against non-union labour and against the property of companies operating shipping, the mines, the wharves and ports. In Melbourne, the announcement that a public meeting was going to be held on the 31st of August 1890 to support the maritime strikers sent the Victorian government into precautionary mode. On the eve of the meeting, the Victorian Mounted Rifles were briefed by the commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Price. Quote, Men of the Mounted Rifles, one of your obligations imposes on you the duty of resisting invasion by a foreign enemy, but you're also liable to be called upon to assist in preserving law and order in the colony. To do your work faintly would be a grave mistake. If it has to be done effectively you will each be supplied with 40 rounds of ammunition, lead in bullets, and if the order is given to fire, don't let me see any rifle pointed in the air. Fire low and lay them out so that the duty will not have to be performed again. End quote. Price was quite clear and quite unapologetic about his intentions. He only wanted to hit the strikers in the legs, not to kill them outright. He explained that the term lay them out was used in his regiment to mean temporary disablement. A force of 1,000 militia and mounted police and another 1,000 special constables were embodied by the time of the meeting. These forces, apart from a troop of mounted police, were held in reserve out of the way and the 40,000 who attended the meeting, although enthusiastic, were orderly and the forces were not called in. Now we get into the Union's defeat. The strike was defeated when the marine officers returned to work on the employer's terms in November of 1890, with Illawarra coal miners being the last workers to return to work in January of 1891. A shortage of money to sustain the strike and a plentiful supply of strike breakers eventually defeated the strikers. Wage cuts were introduced for everyone in the maritime industry, with wage cuts of up to 30%. The defeat of the 1890 Maritime Strike and the 1891 Australian Shearers Strike laid the framework for the Australian Labour Movement entry into parliamentary politics. The New South Wales Labour Defence Committee summed up the union's mood in this statement, quote, The time has come when trade unionists must use the parliamentary machine that in the past has used them, end quote. Now we get into the painters and dockers union's growth. Working conditions and pay for ship painters and dockers in the early 20th century were poor, with 80% of the union's membership in 1939 earning less than the basic wage. 90% of painters and dockers were employed as casuals under the free selection of labour system. This meant that workers had to wait outside shipyards and port workshops where foremen would choose different men to work each day, depending on the requirements of the employer. The union made significant efforts to regulate this system of hiring, including introducing limits on the minimum length of employment and the number of hours workers would wait each day, but with little success. Conditions changed dramatically during World War II as increased demand in the shipbuilding industry led to a labour shortage. The membership of the union grew rapidly, increasing in Sydney from 880 in 1939 to 2792 in 1945. During 1945, the union began operating a roster for painters and dockers, dispatching workers to the various employers as needed. This development was resisted by employers who launched a lockout of all painters and dockers in the port of Newcastle, but agreement was reached in the Commonwealth Arbitration Court in 1946, allowing the practice to continue. The roster was operated out of the branch office of the union in each port, which acted as a hiring hall. Members were allocated jobs each morning based on how long they'd been waiting for work. Refusal to accept a job meant the member would lose his position in the allocation order. Employers retained the right to determine the number of workers required and to reject any workers they thought unsuitable. 
The dangerous and difficult nature of the work, as well as the small and close-knit nature of the workforce, encouraged strong union organisation amongst the painters and dockers, and the FSPDU developed a reputation for militancy. For example, despite representing only 15% of the workforce in the shipbuilding and ship repair industry, the FSPDU was involved in 40% of all industrial disputes between 1975 and 1978. The FSPDU was also notable for being the only union in Australia after 1976 to have more than five percent of its members in the shipbuilding and ship repair industry. Now we get into the decline of this organisation. The FSPDU faced a decline in membership during the late 20th century as mechanisation, including sandblasting and spray painting, and the decline of Australian commercial shipbuilding reduced the number of jobs available. By the late 1970s, membership of the union had fallen to approximately 2,000. Although the union actively defended the work of its members through competition with other unions over coverage, being involved in a high proportion of all demarcation disputes in the shipbuilding industry. As work declined in the industry, employers began to seek the removal of the union roster system, provoking an 11-week strike at the Garden Island Dockyard in Sydney in 1976 and a 16-week dispute in Newcastle in 1978. Both disputes ended with the union retaining the right to operate the roster. Now we get into alleged criminality and deregistration of the union. In the 1960s and 1970s, the union was alleged to have criminal connections. In 1980, the union was subject to the Costigan Royal Commission, officially entitled the Royal Commission on the Activities of the Federated Ship Painters and Dockers Union, inquiring into its involvement with organised crime and tax evasion. Now we get into what the Costigan Commission was all about. The Costigan Commission, officially titled the Royal Commission on the Activities of the Federated Ship Painters and Dockers Union, was an Australian Royal Commission held in the 1980s. Wasn't the first and wasn't the last. Headed by Frank Costigan QC, the Commission was established by the Australian Government on the 10th of September 1980, jointly with the Victorian Government, to investigate criminal activities, including violence, associated with the Painters and Dockers Union, after a series of investigative newspaper articles that detailed a high level of criminality. The Union was represented by prominent Melbourne criminal lawyer Frank Gallaby. The Commission was seen by many as politically motivated in keeping with a long-running anti-union agenda pursued by the governing party of the day. The Painters and Dockers Union was notorious for its criminality and the Costigan Commission investigated numerous crimes including a, a string of murders, assault, tax fraud networks, drug trafficking syndicates and intimidation. Costigan found the Union since 1971 had a positive policy of recruiting hardened criminals who were essentially outsourced to any dishonest person requiring criminals to carry out as project. The commission noted 15 murders in which painters and dockers members were either involved or in which the murder was related to union activities. As the commission investigated further, it found money laundering occurring on an industrial scale, extensive fraud on the social security and pension systems, and the use of the so-called bottom-of-the-harbour tax evasion schemes involving the asset stripping of companies to avoid tax liabilities, and although facilitated by criminals among the painters and dockers union, the practice benefited wealthy individuals. Now we come to the Union. The Royal Commission's investigation soon revealed that many members of the Union were involved in a wide range of criminal activities. Costigan observed that, quote, The Union has attracted to its ranks in large numbers men who have been convicted of and who continue to commit serious crimes, end quote, and that the violence is the means by which they control the members of their group. They do not hesitate to kill. Included in the crimes of union members were taxation fraud, social security fraud, ghosting, compensation fraud, theft on a grand scale, extortion, the handling of massive importations of drugs, the shipments of armaments, all manner of violence and murder. Despite the union's members being careless of their reputation, glorying in its infamy, that very reputation attracted employment by wealthy people outside their ranks who stooped to use their criminal prowess to achieve their own questionable ends. Now we get into broader investigations. In 1984, the Fairfax newspaper The National Times published leaked extracts of the Commission's draft report, which implicated a prominent Australian businessman codenamed The Goanna in tax evasion and organised crime, including drug trafficking, pornography and murder. Australia's richest man, media magnate Kerry Packer, revealed himself to be the subject of these allegations, which he strenuously denied. Packer's own bulletin magazine had been instrumental in the calls for a royal commission into the union. Packer's counterattack was led by his counsel Malcolm Turnbull, later the Prime Minister of Australia, and accused the commission of a misuse of power. No charges were laid against Packer, and in 1987, Australia's Attorney General Lionel Bowen formally dismissed the allegations. 
However, mystery still surrounds Packer's receipt of a supposed loan of an Australian $225,000 in cash from a bankrupt Queensland businessman. When questioned by the commission, Packer testified, quote, I wanted it in cash because I like cash. I have a squirrel-like mentality, end quote. Packer was therefore codenamed the squirrel in the commission's case studies, but the National Times changed this to Goanna to preserve anonymity. The commission concluded in 1984 and the revelations of organised crime led to the establishment of the National Crime Authority, the NCA. The commission also recommended changes to criminal law to deprive criminals of the profit from their crimes. At Kerry Packer's state funeral in February 2006, his son James stated that the Packer family had never forgiven Costigan for what they took to be a smear. Costigan publicly responded that, as royal commissioner, he simply investigated and did not make allegations or prosecute. Now, I did cover all of this in one of my very first episodes in season one of this podcast. I do a deep dive into that case. If you'd like to check it out, it's uploaded on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts from. Now we come to the outcome of this Royal Commission. Although the Costigan Royal Commission found extensive and numerous illegal activities by the Union, it was not deregistered. Rather, the biggest achievement was as a direct result of the Commission was the establishment of a permanent body called the National Crime Authority, now called the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission, ACIC, to investigate criminal enterprises and crimes. Now we get into the bottom of the harbour tax avoidance scheme. A bottom of the harbour tax avoidance was a form of tax avoidance used in Australia in the 1970s. Legislation made it a criminal offence in 1980. The practice came to symbolise the worst of variously contrived tax strategies from those times. In its 1986-87 annual report, the Australian Taxation Office ATO stated a total of 6,668 companies had been involved, involving revenue of between $500 million and $1 billion. Now we get into the operation of this scheme. The operation at the heart of Bottom of the Harbour schemes involved a company that would be stripped of assets and accumulated profits before its tax fell due, leaving it then unable to pay. Once assets were stripped, the company would be sent, metaphorically, to the bottom of the harbour by being transferred to someone of limited means and with little interest in its past activities. The company's records were often lost too. The ATO, being in the same position as other unsecured creditors in the case of an insolvent company, ended up with nothing. Promoters such as lawyers or accountants generally facilitated the transactions. The promoter would help the owners of a company first transfer the assets to a new company which was to continue the business, then the owners sold the old company to the promoter for the value of the untaxed accumulated profits, less an amount representing a fee or commission. For the owners, this was the sale of a capital asset and hence untaxed being prior to capital gains tax. The promoter would have the company pay to the promoter a dividend of the money it had left, then the promoter on-sold the now empty shell to someone else. The way the promoter paid the owners for undistributed profits was similar to a dividend strip operation. In any case, the amount the promoter paid was a tax deduction, since the promoter would be in the business of buying and selling shares, and the dividend would be taxable income, leaving just the promoter's commission taxable, not the whole original company profit. The harbour in the expression was usually taken as referring to Sydney Harbour, which is adjacent to the financial district, though obviously the sense is also general. The actual origin of the name and practice is not clear. Now we get into the Deputy Crown Solicitor debacle. The first time the Australian Taxation Office ATO detected a bottom of the harbour scheme was in 1973. Rod Todman, a senior investigations officer in Perth, found a scheme involving about 50 companies and selected one for investigation. By 1974, he had assembled an evidence which was referred to the Deputy Crown Solicitor DCS in Perth for possible prosecution as a test case. The DCS was uncertain of the prospects for the case, but in late 1974 had a Queen's Council opinion strongly recommending charges of conspiracy to defraud the Commonwealth were brought against the promoter and two other individuals. There then followed delay upon delay, duplicated investigations, ill-prepared reports by inexperienced officers, and even a DCS officer deliberately avoiding contact with the ATO. After five full years in April of 1979 and based on miscommunication, the Crown Solicitor in Canberra advised the ATO that the evidence was insufficient and the case was dropped. It might well have been that it was not strong enough, but that decision was not arrived at in a well-considered way. The performance of the various DCS officers was later the subject of scathing criticism, with problems arising primarily from, possibly deliberately, overworked and underskilled staff and bad management.
The abandoned case came to light in only 1982 in the Costigan Royal Commission investigating activities of the Federated Ship Painters and Dockers Union. The commission came upon bank account transactions for millions of dollars and the paper trail led eventually, and among other things, to the bottom drawers of the DCS Perth. The commission also found that the wife of one of the senior case officers at the DCS Perth was running an escort service and that she was a company secretary at several companies which were involved in bottom of the harbour schemes. There was no suggestion her husband been improperly used his position but the connection was close enough to be extremely embarrassing for all concerned and the officer was dismissed. Now we get into legislation that was made after all this was brought to light. Crimes, Taxation Offences of Act 1980. In 1980, the Crimes Taxation Offences Act of 1980 put an end to the bottom of the harbour schemes. Under the Act, it became a criminal offence for any person to make a company or trust unable to pay tax debts, income tax, sales tax, etc., or to aid or abet any person or, or company doing so. The Act thus caught both of those in the schemes and the promoters of such schemes. It made it unnecessary in the future to address the activity as a crime of defrauding the Commonwealth through the Deputy Crown Solicitor Office, which up to this point had been poorly managed. This Act was controversial at the time since tax avoidance was regarded as something less than an outright crime. Tax matters might normally be addressed by closing a revenue loophole. This Act instead treated bottom of the harbour schemes like frauds. However, once certain behaviour has been criminalised, what was once tax avoidance, which is legal, becomes tax evasion, which by definition is not. Then we have the Taxation Unpaid Company Tax Assessment Act of 1982. The Taxation Unpaid Company Tax Assessment Act of 1982 went further, allowing for the recovery of tax avoided under bottom of the harbour tax schemes between the 1st of January 1972 and the 4th of December 1980. The retrospectivity in this act was controversial at the time, although some argue that law was not retrospective as the tax was always payable. Treasurer John Howard said on the 23rd of September 1982, during the second reading of the bill in the House of Representatives, that the normal reluctance against retrospectivity was tempered by the competing consideration of overall perceptions as to the equity of the fairness of our taxation system and the distribution of the tax burden. End quote. While Senator Don Chip thought the purpose notable, but spoke strongly against the retrospective nature in the Senate on the 19th of November, saying, quote, I do not trust politicians to legislate retrospectively. One of the few protections that the ordinary citizen has is that he knows the law. End quote. Now we come back to the painters and dockers. In 1972, Melbourne's 900 painters and dockers made up a closed, largely criminal subculture. Reasons for their criminality were various. The dockers claimed they were in one of the few industries that gave a man with a record an even break. Cynical police claimed that a prison record was a condition of entry. Youths as young as 15, relatives possibly of existing members, were known to get work on the docks. They soon found that to survive, they must go the way of the others. The late Patrick Shannon, formerly Secretary of the Victorian Branch of the Painters and Dockers Union, claimed that no more than a quarter of his members had prison records. Police estimates went much higher, though. Of the 13-man 1972 committee, 10 or 77 percent had criminal records. The fact that the men had few recent counts against them may go some way towards substantiating claims that the union is a great force for rehabilitation. Whatever the facts, the Melbourne docks offered a readily available pool of criminal talent with the time and the inclination to engage in major outside enterprises. Police estimated that up to 40% of major Melbourne robberies originated from the docks. Interstate jobs were also brokered there. Melbourne dockers were alleged to have had some connection with these robberies. We have the August 1969 Chadstone, Melbourne. Proceeds were $136,000. March of 1970, Maine Nichols, Guildford, Sydney, proceeds was 587,890, which was considered the most biggest robbery at that time. June 1970, Metropolitan Security Services, Melbourne, proceeds $289,680. In April, June and October of 1971, there were three payroll holdups on the docks themselves. In each case, the proceeds were under $10,000. The main Nicholas job then, the biggest holdup in Australian criminal history, was followed by a trial before a Sydney jury where allegations were made that the holdup was masterminded by a man named Leslie Woon and carried out by Frank Baldy Blair, a rigger named Laurie Jones and Melbourne docker and prize fighter Steve Nitties. Woon received $275,000 before leaving the country. Blair, Jones and Nitties shared $270,000. The balance of nearly $43,000 was available for ancillary services connected with the holdup. 
The Sydney gang known as the Toe Cutters then moved in. This was a group of three men who waited for criminals to pull off a job and then extorted part of the proceeds from them. They were more feared than popular. They persuaded Nitties to hand over $20,000. Baldy Blair resisted. His toes were cut off with bolt cutters and he was later murdered and his body disposed of, never to be found. Jones went to Melbourne for protection and Nitties and Jones were later sentenced to 16 years after being convicted for their part in the hold-up. Over the years, the subculture developed rigid social norms that tended to make the men lions aboard but lambs at home. The code was that disputes were settled internally and with guns, no information was given to the police, women and children were not to be touched. The element of gunplay on the dock seemed to be a development of the mid-1950s. In the immediate post-war years, executions were mainly connected with the Baccarat schools. When these were finally closed following a newspaper campaign, things cooled down for a time. Then, in 1958, a famous hitman of the earlier period, dapper, cold-eyed Freddy the Frog Harrison, found himself at a loose end for cash and thought to see if there was a quid on the docks. At 4.40pm on Thursday the 6th of February 1958, in the middle of a pay parade on the 13 South Wharf, a man walked up behind Harrison and said, quote, This is yours, Fred. End quote. The legend is that Harrison was still waiting to hear the blast of the 12-gauge shotgun that blew off half his head. If this public execution was a warning that activities on the dock were in good hands, it was effective. It was anticipated that Harrison's psychic, Norman the chauffeur Bradshaw, alleged executioner of Sydney Hood Big Percy Neville, would take summary action to settle Harrison's account. But after some calculations of the odds, Bradshaw did not pursue the matter and later fell from a great height into Port Phillip Bay inside a small aeroplane. The action that Harrison was supposed to be seeking, a slice of, has been the subject of much speculation. But until the Constantin Royal Commission of 1980 to 1984, the authorities never made any real effort to get the hard evidence. The assumption was that the ship owners could live with the situation as it stood, and given the dockers' talent for keeping their mouths shut, the only likely result of the Royal Commission the police sought in the early 70s would be a total tie-up of the Port of Melbourne. The alleged racket, steadily denied by union officials, related to the famous phantom dockers, levies on members, and the provision of alibis for workers engaged elsewhere. If they existed, the rackets would be lucrative, worth perhaps half a million a year. The theory of the phantom docker was this. A boat and dock required a gang of eight to clean out the holds, or maybe to scrape and paint the hulls. Eight men, including the Mr. A and Other, would be signed on, but only seven would work on the job. The pay packet for Mr. Other would go into deserving hands. Union officials have claimed that the Phantoms no longer existed, if they ever did, and on the face of it, such an operation would be difficult to pursue if the ship owners were careful in their counting of heads. If, however, an imaginary docker got on to 40 or 50 gangs in a week, the take would be upwards of something like $300,000 in a year. As for the levy, if some group within the union had enough muscle to levy each member $5 a week, the return would have been some $4,500 a week or $230,000 a year. Union officials said that the hat was sometimes taken around on payday, but only for the purpose of helping members or their families who'd fallen on hard times. Police said that a foreman on the docks was once touched for some $60,000 by the taxation department. He became a man of property, but retained his position on the docks until an advanced age. A state of armed warfare on the Melbourne docks was in progress with intermissions from 1971. The secretary-treasurer of the Painters and Dockers Union, Jip Dongan, into whose iron fist some small part of the main Nicholas proceeds were alleged in court to have found their way to, died early in 1971. A committee member of the union, Billy the Texan Longley, was also found guilty of getting some of the proceeds. Patrick Shannon was twice asked to make himself available for the vacant position and twice declined. Ultimately, a youngish man named George Carey left a docker's job worth $120 a week to take on the position. He soon found the pressures of office, including a gun thrust into his stomach, too much, and one day he walked out of the union's office at 16 Lorimer Street, South Melbourne, never to return. Some months later, Carey was seen in St Kilda up on a garbage truck. This job probably paid less, but had the merit of being quieter. Shannon finally bowed to the will of the members and took on the position of secretary in mid-1971. At one time, an Adelaide publican, Shannon, then 43, had worked on the docks for 20 years. Shannon was easy and charming in general conversation, but heavily deadpan and gave nothing away when the formal question started. The image he projected was that of a man above the shot shell of the dockers' war. Later, mildly rebuked for his caution, Shannon said seriously, quote, Many lives are at stake.
To regularise the position that attained in 1971, it was decided that a union election be held on Friday, December 10th of that year. Billy the Texan Longley resigned from his position on the committee in order to contest the presidency. Longley, also referred to as the Cowboy, was a shortish, plump, thin-lipped man of 45. He walked with a somewhat waddling gait, owned a champion bull terrier named Boof, and watched a lot of television. In 1961, Longley had appeared in a curious sequence of legal actions. Charged with the murder of his wife, the allegation was that the first Mrs. Longley had been shot in the back. He was found not guilty of that charge, but found guilty of manslaughter. He was sentenced to nine years with a minimum of seven, but appealed and a retrial was ordered. Having already been found not guilty of murder, he could not be retried on that charge, and so was tried for manslaughter. He was then found not guilty of that charge. The second Mrs. Longley described him as a perfect family man, unassuming, a man who neither smoked nor drank. Two tickets, one blue and one white, was distributed for the 1971 elections. The blue ticket, authorised by a Salt Trine Vigilance officer named Doug Spruill, represented the status quo. It was, as it were, Shannon's team. The white team had Longley opposed to the incumbent president and Jimmy Baisley opposed to Spruill for vigilance officer. Otherwise, it was more or less the same as the blue team. A note on the white ticket, which carried no authorizing name, said, quote, Members, we have selected a change in the top leadership of our union. We propose to strengthen the secretary's position by recommending Billy Longley for president and Jim Baisley for vigilance officer. Our secretary, Pat Shannon, is returned unopposed. Therefore, we are that the combination of Longley, Shannon and Baisley will continue to struggle in our interest. End quote. Baisley at one time had been nicknamed Machine Gun, possibly because of the rapidity of his speech. The action began on Tuesday, November 16th of 1971. Guns were brandished in a South Melbourne hotel, but the incident appeared to have subsided when outside the hotel, Bob Crotty, detergent maker of Richmond and friend of Longley, was felled by half a brick, his brains reduced to toothpaste. Crotty's assailant was said to have been a friend of Alfred the Ferret Nelson, social secretary of the union, and supporter of the Blue or Shannon team. Nelson, 47, was a short and almost illiterate man, but he prided himself on being able to tell the time and never willingly moved without his watch. He had been acquitted in 1965 of a charge of shooting with intent to cause grievous bodily harm. On the night of Tuesday, December 7th, three days before the election, Nelson it was believed was bailed up in his Collingwood home while he was having a shower and driven off in his white two-door 1971 charger. His watch remained in his house. The car was later found in 30 foot of water at 21 South Wharf, but Nelson was not. Five men were said to have been involved in the Nelson abduction, including Desmond 3LO Costello, who was a thief, shoplifter, standover man, beneficiary as a contact man in the Mays Nicholas affair, and who had been unsuccessfully charged with the 1961 murder of an invalid named Ormond Hoppy Kelly. Costello was thought to have been the finger man in the operation. On election day, the southern parts of Melbourne were like something out of a western. At 8.05am, gunfire broke out near the ballot box outside the Williamstown dockyard. A car belonging to a member of Shannon's team was hit 50 times. No one admitted seeing any gunplay. As the dockers placed their votes, Baisley stood gun in hand with his boot on the ballot box. At 10am, the door of the union office in South Melbourne was hit with seven bullets, supposedly fired by supporters of the Longley faction. But again, police could gain no information. That night, Spruill's 1957 Holden was burned to a shell. He surmised spontaneous combustion. The following night, Saturday 11th of December, Desmond 3LO Costello was taken shoeless from his home in East Preston. The legend is that Costello asked could he have a cigarette, but was told there wasn't time. He put his hand up to protect his face, and the shotgun blast cut through his wrist and destroyed his face. The forensic people were not certain whether he was cut down by two shotguns or by a single over and under shotgun with barrels of 12 gauge and 410 capacity. The body was dumped on an excavation for a freeway near Collingwood. At 1.05am on the last day of 1971, Lawrence Richard Chammings, 25, was ambushed in Melbourne's most dangerous street, Gertrude Street, Fitzroy. A car drew alongside Chammings' car and he was hit, not seriously, in the shoulder. He then had another 15 months to live. Chammings was said to be a docker, but in May 1972, Union Secretary Pat Shannon said he'd never heard of him. A week before the declaration of the Union poll set for Wednesday the 26th of January 1972, shotgun blasts were fired at Longley's Fortress-like home at 112 Durham Street, Port Melbourne. At 3am on Monday 24th of February, a fire at the Union offices destroyed files going back 30 years, but the ballot papers had been lodged in the vaults of the Commonwealth Bank in the city. At 10.30 on the Tuesday night, a gel ignite and lead bomb was thrown on the veranda of the Durham Street Fortress. Mrs Longley and her seven-year-old daughter had left 15 minutes previously. 
The next morning, two hours before the poll was to be declared, Pat Cullen resigned from the position of returning officer. Three carloads of police attended the meeting, absent were Longley and Baisley. They were found to have been swamped 174.53 and 178.47 respectively. At the end of January 1972, Homicide Chief Kevin Carton sent a report of Docker's activities to Acting Chief Secretary Smith. Smith sent it back, saying he was impressed with the report, but would not say whether the government would initiate an inquiry. Police attempted to cool the situation by invoking the provisions of the Firearm Act and the Consorting Act, but sporadic gunfire continued. Several Dockers had taken to the mattresses and were living three in a house for mutual protection. In March of 1972, there was an echo of the Harrison execution. Shotgun bullets shattered the front window of a house in which resided Charles Wooten, 29. Back in 1958, as a lad of 15, Wooten had found a partially empty box of shotgun shells on 13 South Wharf shortly after Harrison was killed. He didn't know who owned the bullets. There was a further flurry of activity in May of 1972. On Tuesday the 2nd of May at 6am, Jim Baisley, now known as the Cool Man, was fired on as he stepped out of his front gate in McPherson Street, North Carlton. A shotgun charge missed him completely, but 38 bullets lodged in his left shoulder and left thigh. Baisley took a car to the Royal Melbourne Hospital, plucking the bullet out of his shoulder on the way. At the hospital, he said he was too ill to be interviewed and pulled the sheets up over his head when police persisted. Three Melbourne dockers were believed to have gone to Sydney and disposed of two of the toe cutters. On May 26th, Longley was sentenced to three years jail with a minimum of 18 months for receiving $6,000 from the main Nicholas holdup. Another ambush was set up for Baisley on, the September, on September 16th of 1972. A blast from a shotgun entered his back as he sat in a car near his home. He said he had no idea how it happened. The code of the Dockers may inadvertently have been broken on Saturday the 21st of April 1973. At 7.50 that night, a young man said to be red-haired entered the Mooney Valley Hotel in Fitzroy and started spraying bullets. Killed were Lawrence Richmond Chammings, 26, and Nicholas Colverat, 10. Hit but not killed were the boy's father and a friend. This confirmed police fears that sooner or later, if the Dockers were not disarmed, innocent people would be killed. Apart from that, the docks have strangely been quiet. Billy Longley was released from Pentridge in August of 1972. In October, Shannon was drinking with a man and two women in the Druids Hotel, South Melbourne. Just on closing time, a man aged about 50 came in through a side door and fired three 22 caliber bullets into his chest, shoulder and right arm. Shannon died at the table and the murderer disappeared on foot down Moray Street. In May of 1972, Inspector Carden said, quote, There doesn't seem to be much hope for peace on the docks. Some of these men will have revenge if they have to wait two years. End quote. Longley was later convicted of arranging Shannon's murder. The union was finally deregistered in 1993. Despite widespread allegations of criminality, the reason the union was deregistered was because it had fewer than 1,000 members. After the Industrial Relations Act of 1988 was passed by the Hawke government, unions with fewer than 1,000 members had to show way in the public interest their existence should continue. Whilst the dockers opposed the deregistration on principle, it could not advance an argument to continue its existence. Taking the act into account before deregistration, members of the dockers had been transferred to what are now the Maritime Unions of Australia and the AMWU. Several prominent former members were involved in the Melbourne gangland killings. Lewis and Moran and Graham Kinnenborough, for example, were both former members and met on the Melbourne waterfront. Five persons who were members or associated with the union were connected with the attempted robbery of Trans Australia Airlines Flight 454. On the 21st of September 1982, Trans Australia Airlines Flight 454, operated by a McDonnell Douglas DC-9 registered VHTJS, was the subject of an attempted robbery of $600,000 from the Reserve Bank of Australia. The robbery involved four men co-signing themselves as freight, intending to steal the money during two flights of the aircraft. Many of the crimes in which the union were alleged to have been involved in still to this day remain unsolved as well as do many of the murders they were alleged to have committed. With that, this case remains open, but with many unanswered questions, it still remain unanswered. Please rate the show and let me know what you guys think about this and the many other cases I've covered. You can follow me on all major social media platforms, YouTube, BitChute, Dailymotion. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram. Links are all down below in the description. If you have a case you'd like me to have a look at or cover, don't hesitate to send me a message. I'm your host, and this has been the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Until next time, next on unanswered questions. South Canterbury Finance was New Zealand's largest locally owned finance company when it collapsed in August 2010, triggering a $1.6 billion bailout of investors' deposits by the New Zealand government.